Why don't we speak the name of Jesus one more time? I just want to speak. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Over every heart. Over every heart and every mind. Because I know there is peace. I know there is peace within your presence. I speak I just want to speak the name. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to pray. Every dark addiction starts to pray. And we declare there is hope. Declare there is hope and there is freedom. I speak Jesus. One more time. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. I just want to speak the name of Jesus. Till every dark addiction starts to pray. Every dark addiction starts to pray.
Jesus in the streets, Jesus in the darkness over every enemy, Jesus for my Turn and high five somebody and say, Jesus is here. Do it to somebody else and say, You are here. Praise God. Together we can make a difference. Praise God. Hallelujah. I want you to look at these five graduates. I am about to introduce our speaker. And this is not a Bible school commencement address. No, Brother Bernard is going to preach, do whatever the Lord has laid on his heart. And, uh, but Brother Bernard is a strong, everyone say strong, strong. supporter of Bible college. 
<laughs> so, knowing that he leaves tomorrow, we just had to do this today. And so, we are just so excited that Brother and Sister Bernard, you are with us uh, for this occasion. Praise God. Yes, give them a hand of welcome. And we will graduate these students uh, at the end, before we have uh, lunch today. But when you look at these students, they have put in over 1,200, 1,200 hours of class assignment and practical work to stand where they are. That's a lot of hours. Praise God. And have completed over 27 subjects. Praise God. And every single one of them is already working for God. There's not one of them up here that is just going to a church somewhere doing nothing. Every one of them. And you know them all, all right? You know these guys, okay? They're family and friends and uh, they're not new to us. But they are working hard for God already. And uh, I would just like to encourage you, we will have a chance on Sunday morning when we have the superintendent's message, I will again uh, mention Bible school and we will have applications available. We have 26 students right now in Bible school, praise God, this year. Some of them are here, let's give them a hand. Hallelujah. And uh, they are well on, on their way and they are doing all those hours. And you know what Bible school does? Bible school makes a strong church. Makes us strong in doctrine, makes us strong in practical administration, makes us strong in evangelism. It is the strengthening of the church when we take in that teaching uh, and helping us to understand the Word of God and apply it. Praise God. I am so glad again that we have Dr. Bernard here with us. And... Uh, Brother Bernard, I don't know, how many, there's a couple of you here that have, how many of you have written a book? Okay. How many of you have written 30 books? <laughs> and had them published uh, in 42 different languages around the world? Well, the man that's about to come and speak to you is probably more known for that little picture on the back of the book. <laughs> and um, also because it is so important to us, especially as family, brother and sister Bernard have three children who you know, all of them involved in ministry, and six grandchildren. Praise God. I only have two Praise God. Let's give God a hand. Hallelujah. How many of you, and how, my, how many of you, you may subscribe the channel, the YouTube, the Brother Bernard? Put him hand, show him hand, blue you. All right, I knew there was a lot. That's why I thought I'd ask. Those weekly things on, is the vaccine the mark of the beast and all this stuff, it's like, they come to me and I say, go watch Brother Bernard. <laughs> Hallelujah. And uh, how many of you find it a blessing? If you, if you haven't, I recommend go find. It is solid teaching every week uh, on there and uh, just a blessing to the church around the globe. So Brother and Sister Bernard, we are so thankful to have you here. Brother Bernard, come and just in. Enjoy Vanuatu, if I could put it that way. God bless you. Thank you. Praise the Lord, everyone. <laughs> Praise him, big fella. Amen. While you're standing, I'm going to read from Acts chapter 2. And again, Brother Gratian, thank you for those very kind remarks. I feel that I cannot live up to all the expectations. So you'll have to ask the Lord to bless you double to fulfill all of your expectations. But I'm reading from Acts chapter 2 and verse 42. Acts 2.42 says, 
and they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, in the breaking of bread and in prayers. And you may be seated. I want to preach today, and I will do a little preaching and teaching for a few minutes, restoring the apostolic faith. Restoring the apostolic faith. And I will address these five graduates by urging you to be faithful to the apostolic message. That's what's most important. So everything I preach is going to be for them, but also for all of you. Restoring the apostolic faith. Now, I believe the church of the New Testament was established on the day of Pentecost. And from that time till now, there's always been a witness of truth. At the same time, we know in human history, many people fell away from the faith. And many churches became simply formal without the power of the Holy Spirit, without teaching the truth. But in the last century, there's been a great revival of apostolic teaching and a mighty outpouring of the Holy Spirit throughout the whole world. And so we should be part of that, restoring the original faith, restoring the apostolic faith. Now, in Acts chapter 2, we find the birthday of the church. Before Jesus ascended to heaven, he told his disciples, wait in Jerusalem until you receive the promise. You'll see power from God. You'll be filled. You'll be baptized with the Holy Spirit. And so on the day of Pentecost, the believers were waiting, and 120 received the Holy Spirit with the sign of speaking in tongues. That included the 12 apostles, Mary, the mother of Jesus, the women who had followed him faithfully, the four half-brothers of Jesus, and many other disciples, about 120. And then the apostle Peter preached to the crowd, and 3,000 were added to the church. So here we find the story of the beginning of the church, those early believers who are filled with the Holy Spirit. In verse 42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. I'm saying we are part of that church today. We are part of that number because we continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine as I preached last night. But we also continue in fellowship. It's important for us to be united, not to be separated, not to fight one another, not for one church to fight another church, not for one church to try to steal the members of another church. But all of us who preach Jesus' name baptism, all of us who preach the Holy Spirit, all of us who preach the holiness of God, we need to work together as brothers and sisters in Christ. That's why I'm glad we have the name United Pentecostal Church. We're not supposed to be divided. We're not supposed to be independent. We're supposed to be united. Now, to be apostolic, we must have the right doctrine. But to be apostolic, we must also have unity. So we come to a conference, we have a business meeting. Maybe we will vote on some positions. Maybe we will vote on some policies. And maybe we won't all agree. But at the end of the business, we all agree to work together. Even if my personal opinion did not prevail, it does not matter. I'm still part of the church. And I will not fight against the leader. I will not fight against the policy. When it's time to vote, I will vote how I feel in my heart. But when it's time to work, I will work together with all the leaders, with all the policies, with all the church. Because if we're going to be apostolic, we must be apostolic not only in the doctrine, but also in the fellowship. Amen. And then it says the breaking of bread. And that is talking about taking communion together. But it's also talking about having fellowship meals together. And so I'm very glad, Brother Greg, to find we're going to have lunch today. We're going to be truly apostolic. We're going to preach the doctrine. We're going to have fellowship. But after it's over, we're going to break bread together. We're going to be apostolic in the breaking of bread. 
as long as you don't eat too much. And then in prayers, we pray together. We have a relationship with God. So we have a relationship with one another, but we must also have our own personal relationship with God. Being apostolic is not just joining a social club. It's not just joining a political party. But it's having fellowship with one another, yes. But it's also having fellowship with God through prayer and worship. Don't take prayer out of the church. Don't take worship out of the church. If you're going to be apostolic, we must know how to pray. We must pray in the Holy Spirit. We must pray in tongues. We must pray with groanings that cannot be uttered. Sometimes we shout. Sometimes we dance. Sometimes we fall on our face and wail and cry before God. But we must have apostolic prayer. We must have apostolic worship. Amen. So this is what I mean, restoring the apostolic faith. Now, throughout human history, there have been different ways that Christian churches have been formed. One way is on the basis of tradition. So I will just give you an example, not to attack anyone, but to give you example of what I'm teaching. So there is the Roman Catholic Church. They base their doctrine on tradition. They say, if you want to know the truth, then follow what the Pope says. Follow what the councils over the centuries say. Follow what the creeds of the 4th century, the 5th century, the Nicene Creed, all of those creeds. Follow those teachings. They don't really talk about the apostles very much. They want to follow the tradition of the church of today. But there's a problem with that. Because tradition depends on human ability. To pass truth from one generation to the next generation. But humans are sinners. Humans will make mistakes. Humans will change the doctrine. Humans will promote themselves more than the Lord. So tradition is not a very good way. There is a value in tradition. But whatever tradition we have, we must always check it by the word of God. We must go back to the beginning, to the apostles of the first century. We must go back to the New Testament. If our tradition is consistent with the Bible, okay. But if it contradicts the Bible, we must change our tradition and follow the Word of God. Now, I'm wearing a tie because that's our tradition, Western culture. Not because I like to wear a tie in this heat today. But it's because it is the custom for a speaker like me. Well, when I read the Word of God, the Bible doesn't say anything about wearing a tie or not wearing a tie. It's just a tradition. So if I want to follow that tradition, that's okay. But in some places of American society, now they say, well, wear mini skirts, wear bathing suits, wear shorts, and be immodest in public. Even though that is the culture and that is the tradition, when I read the Word of God, it says wear modest clothing. So in that case, I cannot follow my tradition. I cannot follow my culture. I must go back to the Word of God. So if our tradition is neutral, okay. We can follow it if we want. And if our, but if our tradition is contrary to God's Word, we must always choose God's Word. So the problem with churches that just follow tradition, they introduce many new teachings that are not found in the Word of God. Let me give you an example. If you are a carpenter and you're trying to build a building of wood, so you want to have 20 boards of exactly the same length, and you want to cut them. Let's say you measure the first board for the exact measurement, and then you use that one and you use it to measure the second board. Then you use the second board to measure the third board. And on and on till you have 20 boards. What's going to happen? Those boards are going to be of different lengths. And from the first one to the last one, there will be a significant difference. Because each time, there's just a little change. At least, it's not exact. And so, at the end, the error will be very big. 
If you want to make all the boards the same as much as possible, you measure each one by the same original measurement. Amen? And so it is with the church. We are in the 21st century. If we just take what was in the 20th century, and the 20th century takes what's in the 19th century, and on and on, by the time we go to the first century and compare, there will be a big difference. If you want to make sure the church is the same, that there's no difference, that there's no error, every church, every nation, every age, go back to the original. Go back to the first century. Go back to the apostles. Go back to the Bible. Go back to the book of Acts. Let's restore the apostolic faith. Amen. And then you have other churches that are called Protestant. The Methodists and, oh, Seventh-day Adventists, Assemblies of God, different groups. And they go back to the 1500s, Martin Luther. He was a Roman Catholic priest. And the church at that time taught salvation by faith and works. So in order to be forgiven of your sins, you have to do works of righteousness. Say a hundred prayers. Uh, and so, uh, or beat yourself on the back. Or crawl on your knees to the church. And so Martin Luther was trying to do all these things to have forgiveness of sins. But he still felt guilty. He read in Romans chapter 1, the just shall live by faith. He realized, I can't be saved by works. I must be saved by faith. That's a good thing. So he took the church of the Middle Ages, the church of the 1500s, and he changed it to reform it. And so we have what we call the Protestant Reformation. It's called Protestant because they were protesting the false doctrines of the Catholic Church. They were called Reformation because they wanted to reform the existing church. So that was a good thing. I thank God that God used Martin Luther to break the tradition. But he did not go back to the original. He stayed with the church that existed and tried to fix a few things that needed to be fixed. But other people were going back to the word of God and they were seeing more and more and more. So some people begin to receive the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. And Martin Luther says, don't be fanatical. Don't get too excited. Some people begin to baptize in the name of Jesus Christ because they found it in the book of Acts. And so some of Luther's followers, they said, oh, these people are baptizing in Jesus' name. We need to stop them. We need to warn them. It's false doctrine. Martin Luther answered. You can read it in his books. He said, we cannot forbid them because they're only doing what the apostles did in the book of Acts. However, Martin Luther did not think it was necessary to follow that himself. He continued to baptize babies, even though he saw in the Bible you could not prove it. He continued to baptize by sprinkling or pouring, even though in the Bible he saw the Greek word for baptism means full immersion plunging, dipping. He continued to baptize Father, Son, and Holy Spirit even though he saw in the Bible, the book of Acts, the apostles baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Why didn't he do all these things? Because he did not think it was necessary to change everything. He wanted to keep church of that time and reform it. So even though the changes he made were good, he did not go back to the beginning. So you have many different Protestant denominations. They all have changed one or two things. And that's good. But they don't think it's necessary to go back to the beginning. And then we have the Pentecostals. That's us. A little over 100 years ago, some preachers began to preach. Everyone needs to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit speaking in tongues. And these men, even though they had not received it yet themselves, they began to preach. So it wasn't in their experience. It wasn't in their tradition. 
It wasn't in their denomination, but they found it in the Bible. So they said, let's receive what the apostles received. And that led to the great outpouring of the Holy Spirit, the great Azusa Street Revival in Los Angeles, California, USA. And from there to every nation of the world, even today. Praise God. That's the third method of restoring the original faith. So notice I've shared with you what has been done in history. First, simply following tradition. That's not good enough. Second, simply trying to reform some errors. That's not enough. The third, we must go back to the original. We must restore the original apostolic faith. We must baptize in Jesus' name. We must receive the Holy Ghost speaking in tongues. We must have a genuine apostolic experience. Our message should be apostolic. Our experience should be apostolic. Our unity should be apostolic. Our prayer should be apostolic. We need to restore the apostolic faith. Now you might ask me, why is that better? Why is your choice better? Here is my answer. Because that is how Jesus Christ established the church. Every Christian group says Jesus is Lord, right? If Jesus is Lord, we need to follow Jesus. How did Jesus establish the church? Jesus did not start any local churches. He did not come to Vanuatu and start a church. He did not even start a church in Israel. Jesus did not write any books. We don't have any videos of Jesus. How did Jesus start the church? He chose 12 apostles, and then later he chose the apostle Paul to be the apostle to the Gentiles. He trained these men. He gave them anointing. He empowered them to write scripture, and the church has been established by the apostles. So when we say go back to the apostles, we're saying go back to the method of Jesus. Go back to how Jesus started the church. I will show you this in scripture. Well, first of all, what I just read, the early church, all the believers, 3,120 and more were added later. They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. Notice the emphasis on the apostles. And then if you read the Great Commission, Matthew chapter 28, Jesus, right before he ascended to heaven, he gave the commandment for all of his disciples to obey. He said, go and make the disciples of all the nations, baptize them. And then notice in Matthew chapter 28, verse 20, I want you to notice carefully what Jesus told those disciples. Matthew chapter 28 and verse 20, he says, teaching them, that's teaching the converts, teaching the baptized people, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. So Jesus taught the apostles the apostles taught the converts. We are the converts. We're supposed to follow the teaching of the apostles. That is the method of Jesus Christ. Let's go a little further in John chapter 17. We find Jesus praying. Now you may say, I thought Jesus is God. How could he pray? Well, he was also a man. So as a human, he prayed. He was a holy man. If I told you Jesus was a real man, you knew, you know. He grew hungry. He grew thirsty. He grew weary because that's what humans do. If I tell you Jesus is a holy man, you know Jesus prayed. He obeyed the will of God. He submitted to God because that's what a holy man does. So as a true human being, he prayed. But just remember at the same time, God was manifest in him. So he was praying as an example for us. And he was praying a blessing upon the disciples. So notice carefully in John chapter 17, verse 17, Jesus is praying. And here's what he says. Sanctify them by your truth. 
Your word is truth. This is, this is the gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 17. He says, sanctify them. Sanctify means set apart. So Jesus prays, God, separate my disciples from the rest of the world. How will that happen? By truth. That's what makes us different from everyone else. The truth. Where do we find truth? Jesus said, your word is truth. So the disciples would have a separate identity based on the word of God. Not just feelings, not just denomination, but the truth of God's word. And then read in verse 20. So now we're looking at the gospel of John, chapter 17, verse 20. I do not pray for these alone, but also for those who will believe on me through their word. So Jesus says, I pray for these disciples here. But I also look forward in the future. I'm not only praying for the disciples here. I'm praying for all the future disciples who will believe on me through their word. That's us. We have never seen Jesus Christ in the flesh. But we believe on Jesus. Why? Because of the preaching of the apostles in the New Testament. Jesus prayed for us. Do you believe it? Jesus looked forward to 2022 to Vanuatu, Port Villa, to the General Conference of the United Pentecostal Church. And he says, I pray a blessing on these believers because they believe on me through the words of the apostles. Oh, praise the Lord. You have a blessing today. You have a blessing from Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. So when you're discouraged, remember, Jesus prayed for me. When the devil attacks you, you rebuke him and say, devil, you're defeated because Jesus prayed for me. He saw me. He knew me. He prayed for me. You say, how do you know Jesus prayed for you? Did you believe on Jesus through the words of the apostles? Now, if you just believed according to tradition, no prayer for you. If you just believe according to maybe a little bit of reformation, no prayer for you. But if you believe on Jesus through the apostles preaching, then there is a blessing for you today from the Lord Jesus Christ. He prayed for you. Hallelujah. Verse 21, he continues the prayer that they all may be one. Now, somebody says, oh, well, the Catholics and the Methodists and the Seventh-day Adventists and the Mormons and United Pentecost Church, we should all be one. That's not what he's saying. They may all be ones. He's saying the future believers should be one with the original apostles. That's the plan of Jesus. Not everybody believing many different doctrines but all believers being united with the apostles, being united with the original church. I say, United Pentecostal Church of Vanuatu, let's restore the apostolic faith throughout our nation in every island. Restore the apostolic faith. Oh, praise the Lord, somebody. Hallelujah. And so what does that mean? I go back to Acts 2 to look at it just again. First, we must have the apostolic experience. We must be filled with the Holy Spirit, speaking in tongues. Second, we must have the apostolic doctrine. Third, we must have apostolic unity. As I said, fellowship, breaking of bread. That is horizontal relationship relationship with one another. Fourth, we must have 
prayer and worship. If you read the rest of the chapter, they had prayer. They had worship. They gave offerings sacrificially. They went to every house and to the temple praising God. They had miracles and gifts of the Spirit. Notice they had a vertical relationship. Prayer and worship directly to God. Number five, as I mentioned, they had the gifts of the Spirit. Every local church should have the gifts of the Spirit. You should pray for the sick to be healed. You say, sometimes they're not healed. Don't worry about that. Keep praying. God is the one who will decide. But we, the church, will pray. We should expect miracles, signs, speaking in tongues, prophecy, discerning of spirits, healing, miracles. It's all for your church. It's for your island. It's for your city. It's for your village. That's restoring the original faith. And when we do that, Acts 2.47 says, The Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. So if we have the apostolic experience, apostolic doctrine, apostolic unity, apostolic praise and worship, apostolic miracles, then we can expect the church will grow. Your assembly will grow. But not only that, you will send workers to start new churches. And together, the whole nation, you will see the growth of the church. If we are content with tradition, we will fall apart. If we're content with reformation of one or two things, we will fall apart. But if we will restore the original apostolic church, we will grow. We will have revival. We will see miracles. God will bless the church. Let's restore the apostolic faith. Graduates, let's restore the apostolic faith. Oh, let's worship the Lord together right now. Let's stand and praise him. Praise him, big fellow master. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. There's not much more apostolic than teaching and training. Like Paul told Timothy, what you have heard from me in the presence of many witnesses, commit to faithful people who will be able to teach others also. It's apostolic to preach and teach all the doctrines the apostles taught. But you know what? Once we get people saved, we have to help them become disciples. Yeah. Amen? Amen? And part of that is knowing what to teach. You may be seated for just a minute. Hallelujah. I can tell you, a lot of you are using cameras and that to film, and that's fantastic. But all of this is live and is on YouTube, and we'll be able to get you a copy or something as well if it's needed. Uh, so feel free to film, yes, but don't let that camera get in the way of your worship and enjoying the moment in the conference. <laughs> Amen? <laughs> Hallelujah. If you need a copy, just see the sound team. They'll give you where to get it, or they can uh, organize it for you to get it on your phone. They can uh, airdrop it or something for you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. You know, the, I've, I've come and taken the microphone after a lot of preachers in all the years. I've never come and taken the microphone behind one who has just finished it all and there's nothing more to say. <laughs> there's abs I get up after Brother Bernard last night and again this morning and it's like, he said it all. 
It's like it's the complete package. He's built the house, put the windows on, put the roof on, carpeted everything, painted it, and then turned the lights on at the end, and we're all happy. It's all complete. Praise God. <laughs> Hallelujah. Hallelujah. A lot of things that Brother Bernard said, I go back and listen to them again because there was little statements in there that you can hear over and over and over and over, and it's just like, yes, that's it, that's it, that's it. Hallelujah. Being one with the apostles. Amen. That's what it's about. Praise God. Praise God. This morning we have a, a very uh, special time. We're going to have some fellowship together afterwards. But we have some wonderful graduates that have worked very hard. And then just when they were getting ready to graduate uh, for one reason or another over the last uh, year, couple of years, uh, they haven't been able to graduate. And so they have been very patient and very gracious and kind. And uh, these are special people. Uh, one of them even had changed their name. I have a certificate that says Pamela Lowey, and now it's Pamela Alvin. <laughs> Hallelujah. But <clears throat> it's, a very, it's a very special and momentous occasion, and we are just so proud of the effort. Most of the teaching for these graduates was done by Brother Vestal and our other teachers, Sister Rachel, Sister Gratian, uh, Sister Dolly, should, she's not here this morning, uh, and our other teachers from here, and of course our chairman, uh, Pastor Tangalabani. Praise God. Aren't you glad God has given us such wonderful <laughs> teachers and leadership for the Bible school? If you look at the people that teach in the Bible school, of course, all of us know uh, Brother Tankalabani, but we have very, very well educated as well teachers uh, that we are excited. And this year, we have been blessed to have join our team, Brother and Sister Lugo. Praise God. And uh, such a blessing. And if they're here when you, this lot of students graduate, they will play a big part in that because they have been teaching day after day after day after day. And uh, we just really uh, appreciate that so much. Let me encourage you before we actually give the charge and graduate these uh, students. Let me encourage you. If you have been to Bible school, and I'm looking at many of you, many of you have. If you have been to Bible school, refresh your knowledge. Because you did Bible school, some of us did it many years ago. But because you got your initial diploma or degree from Bible school, don't sit on it. Continuing education is very important. And so maybe you think, well, I did it. You know what? Pull out the books. Find some way to study. Ask someone in leadership what is a course that you would recommend? Even teach. If you're not teaching yourself, you're not really learning the material yet. You really learn it at the next level when you teach it to somebody else. And so pull out those textbooks. If you've lost your textbooks, why is everyone smiling? I know in this heat and this climate and conditions, it's hard to hang on to that. But let me tell you, I will give you your textbooks back again free if you're going to teach somebody with it. All right? If you need your textbooks, <laughs> some of you are still smiling. You really <laughs> Hallelujah. If you need your, your, a textbook back or you want an updated one of what's being taught today, please let us know. We have a wonderful new photocopier printer. We can reproduce those. But let's get out there, all of us, those that graduated 30 years ago and those of us that are graduating today, let's get out in Vanuatu and let's teach this apostolic doctrine. Amen. 
Let's use what we have. It doesn't do anybody any good sitting on our shelves or being lost and not being used. Let's teach somebody. Amen. Praise God. I read again. 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 2, what you have heard. Paul was speaking to Timothy. What you've heard, take it. Find, and I'll just paraphrase, find other faithful people who will teach others and commit to them uh, this, this wonderful message that you have. Find somebody that is hungry for the Word of God. It only might be one person. Find that one person and teach them the Word of God. Hallelujah. I grew up under an evangelist. When I was a teenager, my pastor, many of you have heard me talk about him, uh, Pastor Philip Favaloro, and uh, he was an evangelist before he came into this message, a very well-known evangelist with, a, uh, with the assemblies and uh, before he was baptized in Jesus' name. And he preached next to some very famous preachers. He's in the Assemblies of God archives in their history books. And uh, <clears throat> he, uh, he would fill a church up, you might understand this, and then he'd empty it out because he'd just keep preaching hell and heaven and everything else. And people would come, 30 people at a time in a small church in Australia would come just to hear him preach. He'd chock us, the, it would be packed out, and then two months later it would be empty again, and then it would be packed out. And I'm saying this for a reason, I'm not just sharing my stories. I saw him as a teenager in the middle of preaching. He would come off the platform. I was sitting one time in church, sitting about th four rows back, right about there, somewhere just like back behind. In the middle of his preaching, he leaps off the platform and sitting in front like where Brother Pastor Robert is, sitting there, there was a first-time visitor. Never been to church before. Just come to church. Very first time. He leaps off the platform in the middle of his message and starts casting a demon out of them. I'm sitting there like, I'm, I'm used to his kind of ways. But he would see people's faces in prayer. He was such a man of God. I'm saying this for a reason, okay? You can think about it later. He would see in prayer, he was a man of prayer, he would see people's faces in his prayers before he got to church of who would be there. And God would have listed all their sins. And his wife was very quiet, very gentle. And he would say, Sister Fav, go tell that person to stop living in adultery or God's going to judge them. She would look at him and say, God told you, you go tell them. But I was in his youth group. And you know what our youth group activities consisted of? Going out and preaching on the streets. We didn't play volleyball. We didn't play table tennis. We didn't do all that. Now we did it like when he wasn't looking. <laughs> but every Friday he had us go out on the streets and I would play my guitar and the youth would be there and we would preach to all the drunken people and preach to all the people coming out of the nightclubs and we would preach and they would throw stuff on us, they would screw up the tracks we're trying to hand them out, shove them down our shirts, they, they would just, you know what, I don't think any of them got saved, but I did. And so did every other youth person that came through that youth group had their life changed forever. Because it may not have convinced anyone, our, our poor attempt as young people to share the gospel may not have convinced anyone. But what I'm saying is that we learn what we believe when we try and teach it to somebody else. When we have to get out there in front of somebody and tell them Jesus is coming back. And that's about all we do. Jesus is coming back. Hell is real. You need to repent. Jesus loves you. Probably terrible. You know, you look at it, I look back at it now and I think, mm, I'm not sure if all that was, was good. But 
This was the kind, that's who God put us with. Brothers and sisters, this is what sharing the gospel is all about. This is what getting back to the apostolic doctrine is all about. Amen. We can do it all and study and learn, but the apostles didn't keep it hidden. It wasn't done in a secret place in a corner somewhere. It wasn't just some writing assignments and doing this and doing that. No, they got out amongst unfriendly people and began to preach and teach the doctrine of Jesus Christ. Let's take this message throughout Vanuatu. Amen. We have people, I look at, at, at some of you here, I won't name names, you, but, but I look at some of you here. We have people that you are in church and I am in church today because of them. I want to look down the line and say, there's somebody that I witnessed to. There's somebody that they're in church because I shared the gospel with them. Amen. Because I helped them through their hard time. I helped them to learn to have faith. I prayed with them through their hard time. Amen. And as we do, that is very, very apostolic. Praise God. And graduates, I am so proud of every one of you. I could, some of you, I could read your curriculum vitae. I could read what you've done. Some of you, I could read what you're doing right now. And we would all be so very proud. These people already know the great things that you've done and that you, are, that you are doing. And so you know when I say that, I'm not saying it empty. Some of you have walked many paths in life already. Some of you are just starting out. But let me tell you, Jesus prayed for you. And nothing else really matters. Jesus prayed for you. He prayed for you. And when, as our bishop said, when the going gets hard and discouragement tries to settle in, just remember, Jesus prayed for me. Jesus prayed for me. As I unite with the apostolic doctrine, I claim every prayer that Jesus prayed. Praise God. If you would stand with me this morning. I'm going to <clears throat> read the charge from the Bible. And then I am going to put my suit jacket back on. And we are going to let these students graduate. Praise God. Does that sound okay? And then after that, they are going to walk and they are going to line up the front. After that, if you would like to take photos, shake hands. Now, while they are receiving their diplomas, uh, I will, you, uh, you can take as many photos of, as you like as well. Uh, we are more than happy uh, for that. These diploma, diplomas <clears throat> are issued by the Global Association of Theological Studies. Um, and we are proud of our school to be a part of that body. Praise God. <clears throat> Praise God. Students, Second Timothy chapter 4, verse 1 to 5. I charge you, therefore, before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the alive and dead at his appearing and his kingdom preach the word everyone say preach the word, preach the word. be ready at any time be instant in season out of season reprove rebuke encourage and exhort with all long suffering with all patience and doctrine for there will be a time when people will not listen to good doctrine, but after their own carnal lusts shall heap up to themselves teachers 
I'm going to paraphrase this little section here. The King James says, having itching ears. In other words, wanting to hear only what pleases them. And they shall turn away from listening or having their ears from the truth. And they'll be turned unto human stories. But be alert, be aware, and watch in all things. Go through afflictions. Do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof. Let there be no doubt, I paraphrase again, or any question in anybody's mind that God has called you to the ministry. Be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the attacks and the wiles of the devil. We do not come in close combat or wrestle with flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world. That's why we must take the whole armor of God, that we are able to stand in a dark and evil day. And having done everything that is required of our ministry, we stand. Stand, have your loins go about with truth. Have on the breastplate of righteousness your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, take the shield of faith, where with using it you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. Put on the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is, everyone say, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Praying Always, with all prayers, requests and fellowship, supplication in the Spirit, and watching thereunto, with all diligence of faithfulness and perseverance, and praying for all saints. Rejoice in the Lord always. Let me say that again. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again. I say, rejoice. Let your self-control, your dedication to the ministry, your moderation be known unto all men because the Lord is close by and is at hand. Don't worry about anything. But in everything, through prayer and requests to God, with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And when you do this, the peace of God which goes beyond our human reasoning and understanding and ability to figure out, shall keep your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. Hallelujah. I would ask for all of the board members that are here to come. And before they walk, we are going to lay hands on everyone on the platform. I would like us to lay hands on our graduates this morning and pray with them. If you are one of their pastors, I would like you to come. Hallelujah. Praise God. And let's pray together. That God would strengthen, encourage, and use, and that living for God, yes, there will be trials and hard times, but that's not the focus. We keep our eyes on Jesus. Amen? Amen. 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 And I am going to ask Pastor Jeff, who has had a long history with the Bible school and teaches even now, and I'm asking him without any warning, but I'm going to ask Pastor Jeff if you would lead us in prayer. And each and every one of us will pray together. Amen. Let's pray. Praise the Lord. Press up your hand and let's pray together. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus, hallelujah. Oh, God, we will I bless him you today, oh, God. We will I glorify him and bless you today, oh, God. You are God, oh, Lord. 
Oh, your hands be upon these students, oh God. Your hands be upon them, oh God. They have a great determination to save you. They have a great determination to lend your word, oh God. Oh, Father God, I pray in the name of Jesus, oh Lord, that you help them today, oh God. Oh God, the word that you have put them in their minds, oh God, and in their heart. Help them, oh God, the Lord, when you take them out, oh God, Lord, this for the world, oh God. Help them, oh God, to walk, oh God, and live according to your word, oh Father. Let them, oh God, only demonstrate them this for a life, oh God. Lord, this for a lost world, oh God. That they may see, oh God, through the testimony, oh God. They may see, oh God, through the word of God, that they shall show them, oh God. I pray in the name of Jesus, oh Lord. Help them, oh God, hallelujah, to believe in your God, to trust your God. They pluck them out, what pray, oh God, and put them into action, oh God. Chance them, oh God, into the man, man and the woman, oh God. Oh, hallelujah. We really love of you today. This wall, oh God, but it can blow seven, oh your God, through those students, oh God. This wall, oh God, but it can blow God, revival through these seven of yours, oh God. I pray, oh God, bless them, oh God, anoint them, oh God, and keep them safe, oh God, out from the hand of the enemy, oh God. We pray today, Lord, your blessing will be upon them, oh God. Your glory will be upon them, oh God. Oh, hallelujah, Jesus, hallelujah. Oh God, may I stand, oh God, and spread this gospel around this island of Vanuatu, oh God. Use them mightily, oh God, in your own way. We love you today and we commit them, oh God, into your hands, oh Lord. Oh, hallelujah. We will bless you and we will glorify your name, oh God. We will exalt your name, oh God. In Jesus, 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 mighty name, oh Lord. May will I humbly pray, oh Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise God, praise God. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I would ask you about Chairman, Pastor Tanglebani, if you would come up. Brother Bernard, if you would be willing. And you know what I think would be nice? I think it would be very nice to have Sister Bernard up here. We have like a majority of ladies this year. Sister Bernard, would you be willing to do that? Sorry for not pre-asking you and asking you in public. That's even worse. Praise God. But if you would be willing. Oh. If our graduates could wear their gowns, they could wear this. <laughs> out of just out of respect, because I respect you guys so much. I really do. If you would come over here, Pastor Tanglebani, and then... Brother and Sister Bernard, if you'll face me, face me, line up over here. That's, that's it, that's it. And I'm going to let, I'm going to call their name, read out their qualification, and then I'm going to give it to Brother Tankalabani. Hallelujah. I'll tell you more about this man later. He's such a blessing. And then if you guys can just present and shake hands and just do it slow so we can, uh, they can enjoy the moment. Praise God. Praise God. Sister Linda Cowpoy, on behalf of Apostolic College of Theological Studies, I am so glad to re reward you with this Diploma of Ministerial Development. Sister Linda Cowboy is hereby awarded this by the Board of Directors of Global University of Theological Studies on November the 30th, 2022, but the date is earlier. But I will praise God. Sister Linda, God bless you. Praise God. Maybe you just want to hold that together and get a photo. Let's do that. There you are, there you are, thank you. Praise God. Wonderful, wonderful, that's what we need to do. Also awarded a diploma of mini... Also awarded...
also awarded a Diploma of Ministerial Development by the Board of Directors of Global University of Theological Studies, Brother Godwin Ligo. Also awarded Diploma of Ministerial Development, again by the Board of Directors of Global University of Theological Studies, Sister Aliane Boy. Praise God. Let's give them, them another hand this morning. Water Diploma of Ministerial Development by, from the Apostolic College of Theological Studies of Vanuatu and the Board of Directors of Global University of Theological Studies, Sister Jemima Thomas. God. Diploma of Ministerial Development by the Board of Directors of Global University of Theological Studies, Apostolic College of Theological Studies to Sister Pamela Lowy Albin for this. But <laughs> Praise God. Praise God. Aren't you proud of our graduates? Hallelujah. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Let's stand together, shall we? We're going to sing a short chorus and we'll close in prayer. And I can see, oh, it looks wonderful up the back. Praise God. And that is for all our pastors, leaders, Bible school students, everyone that... Uh, that uh, in those categories. I'll uh, let Brother Vakaran make any further announcements on that uh, before, before we finish. There's going to be revival in the land. Amen. We're just going to sing it one or two times. Praise God. There, there. There. <laughs> I'm not leading the worship. <laughs> there, there, there. There. Boom. Go. There, there, there's gonna, there's gonna be revival in the land. There's gonna be revival in the land. From the north to the south, from the east to the west. There's gonna be revival. Oh, there's gonna be revival. Yeah. There's gonna be revival in the land. Oh, there's gonna be revival in the land. There's gonna be revival in the land. From the north to the south, from the east to the west, there's gonna be Revival, oh, there's gonna be revival, yes, there's gonna be revival in the land. Hallelujah, 
Hallelujah. Father, we love you. We thank you for this great day, this great moment, oh God. We thank you, Lord, for these graduates. Lord, for everything that you have done and are going to do in each of their lives and in all of ours, oh God. We thank you for this food. We give you praise for it. We ask that you would bless it and dismiss with us this morning. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, amen. Brother Vakarin, is there any announcements? Praise God. Praise God. I'll let Brother Vakarin make any announcements and then... Uh, we can just worship the Lord and come by our graduates this morning. Thank you too much, Bishop. Okay, the uh, people who are in the is set up for lunch, for ministers, Bible school students, and uh, by lunch, we will help them to move from the church. So, then you come to the second, and then move from the church, and then we will set up for the And then also, I think by all uh, missionaries, we will start around. Maybe you can see the chance to 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 